Thank you, Tina, and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to my colleagues for taking the time out of their busy work to uh, be here this afternoon. In an event uh, such as we're facing right now with the novel coronavirus, um, one of the key pieces in how we respond is getting good, accurate information to, uh, to our citizens. So today is really about making sure Nova Scotians understand what uh, COVID-19 is, uh, how we're responding to it, and, 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 and what, what they potentially uh, need to do about it now and, and moving forward. As folks are well aware, uh, late December, a, a novel coronavirus was identified. We, we, there, coronaviruses are new, but this is a new strain of coronavirus that hasn't been seen before in, in China. And probably for the first six or eight weeks of that, it was really a, an event that was focused in China, and our response was staying very much in touch with uh, our national, international colleagues and understanding what was ha happening in China and how we respond uh, to people traveling to and from China. We have now seen in the last uh, couple of weeks, two or three weeks, and, and even more so uh, in the last few days, clearly this uh, virus is now spreading to most parts of the world. The only continent that hasn't been affected is Antarctica. We're now seeing it in, in parts of North America. And so, that, so uh, and we're now seeing more and more cases in Canada. So what we're dealing with now, as we know, is becoming more and more likely that we're going to get community spread uh, in parts of Canada. We already have a, a case in British Columbia where they're, they're investigating as a possible that the source could be spread within British Columbia. So as we see more and more cases coming from other parts of the world, it becomes more likely that we're going to see spread. And I think, so we're, we're focused on that in Nova Scotia. A little bit about the virus. We know what this virus is. It's a coronavirus. But the fact that it's a novel virus means that there is no underlying immunity in the population. And we don't have a vaccine. And there's an, a vaccine is, is a year or at least probably two or more years uh, down the road if we need it at that time. So we have to respond to this event where there's no underlying immunity and no vaccine relying on understanding how the, how the virus is spread and understanding how we can interrupt that transmission. So I'm going to get a little bit technical now, but I think it's really important that people understand actually how this virus is spread. It's, the technical term is it's spread by droplets. So that means when we cough or sneeze that the virus goes out of our nose or mouth and it's big enough that within about two meters or six feet away from us, it's big enough it falls to the ground. So if you're in close face-to-face -face contact with somebody who's coughing or sneezing with this virus, you can become directly exposed. The, uh, the, the probably the more common way, though, is that people, if you cough or sneeze and the virus goes onto the surface in front of me, or I cough and sneeze and I have the virus on my hand, uh, and then I go about, I put my hand on, on the surface, I put my hand on a, a railing, a doorknob, a, a, a sink or a, a tap. Somebody else comes along and puts their hands on that same surface. We know the virus can live on surfaces for several days um, and now they have it on their hands. And as humans we often touch our, through our days, we put our hands to our, our face uh, and then we infect ourselves. So the ways we can actually that are effective to really decrease the transmission of this are, first of all, decreasing close face-to-face -face contact with somebody, especially if they're coughing. Good hand washing, because hand washing, if we have virus on our hands, either from coughing into our hands, or if my hands have been around and I have virus on my hands, frequent, frequent hand washing. Avoiding touching my face, especially if my hands haven't been washed before I put my hands to my face. Those are all really, they sound basic, but they're really important and they actually work. The evidence would show that if we get really good practice of those personal protective measures with this virus, we can decrease transmission by 30 to 50 percent. So it's, I, I, I spent a bit of time with that, but I think it's important that people understand why when we say hand washing, why it actually is important to do that, understanding going back to how, what, what the virus is and how it's spread. As we prepare for the likelihood of community spread of, 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 uh, of this virus, uh, and I'm going to use the term COVID virus, which COVID-19, which really refers to the illness, but it's uh, the simple term that everybody's using. So as we prepare for the spread of COVID-19 here in Nova Scotia, 
we have to understand what are the, what are the potential implications if we have widespread. First and foremost, it could uh, large numbers of people with respiratory illness needing care will create pressures on our healthcare system. Second of all, large numbers of people who are, are sick, we understand that four to five people who get this illness don't require hospital care. Uh, but that means we have to be prepared the hospital system for the one out of five people who do require hospital care. And we know that the, 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 the people who are older, so seniors, especially seniors with chronic conditions, are those most vulnerable to getting severe illness from this disease. So our hospital systems need to prepare, our healthcare system needs to prepare for that. But we could also have lots and lots of people who are sick, or maybe there's somebody in their family sick. They don't need to health care, but they need to be at home to, uh, so they're not spreading it around, or they need to be at home to care for somebody else who's sick. That will create pressures across all sectors around maintaining core business of whatever that core business is in your sector with significantly reduced numbers of people. The third thing is that we need to, we may potentially need to do things that disrupt our society as the way it normally is. So we may have to turn to things like closing, shutting down mass gatherings, closing public facilities, those kind of things that ultimately may be necessary to protect people, especially to protect seniors, but cause disruption. So all those will be done, if we have to do them, done very thoughtfully and carefully, but those potentially would have implications. And the last thing we have to be aware of is it, all these things can create a lot of public fear and anxiety, which in itself can become an issue. So how do we manage that? So all our planning is based on trying to minimize and mitigate all in, in those four uh, key areas. Our response to date has been based around travelers coming in to Canada and coming into Nova Scotia, making sure we have strong border measures at our international airports, identifying people with travel history and, and potential symptoms, and also putting systems in place in a, at what I call the access points to our healthcare system. So in every province and territory is doing this. So 811, 911, primary care, emergency departments all have been using screening tools that all been based on people who have the right travel to the right area and having symptoms that could be respiratory disease and then testing those individuals. And we have been doing that for several weeks. That, that the screening we've used has, has shifted as the epidemiology shifts and will continue to change our approach uh, around travelers as the epidemiology and the gro gro global spread continues. So what we're doing today may well change in the coming days uh, and weeks ahead. Our and and our, our testing has been based on people with the, the, the travel and, and the symptoms. We're doing that testing, referring people to hospitals when they screen in because we need to do it in hospitals so we can apply good infection control because when you're taking the, the test, which is, requires a swab going through the back of the nose into the throat, increases the risk of the healthcare worker taking the test being exposed, so they need to wear appropriate uh, 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 a surgical mask and then a face shield uh, to, protect, to protect themselves for, from, a, from a droplet spread respiratory virus. So far to date, we've had Nova Scotia, 23 people uh, have had, had test, tested in Nova Scotia. All of them have been negative. We do not have any cases of coronavirus here in Nova Scotia at this time. I think I stress that because there's been rumors out there which create a lot of would create a lot of challenges, add to fear and anxiety. So we really need to appeal to people to use their social media very responsibly around uh, this issue. Um, and so we've been working with our healthcare systems to make sure we have access to testing through emergency departments, and, and at the same time, our healthcare system is doing the work. Uh, based on what we developed for H1N1 and the experience we developed for that, as well as what we did for things like Ebola, we have a lot. So we have a lot to build on. How do we start to stand our healthcare system up uh, to deal with large numbers of people with respiratory illness, uh, and and at the same time maintaining as best as we can. Uh, being able to meet the other health care needs of, of Nova Scotians. So we're very much in the process of, as we respond, build the, 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 the approach, appropriate screening and testing uh, and caring for people if they did have COVID-19, 
starting to build the, the uh, plans of how we would adjust in the healthcare system. We've also started now to work uh, across government because of so the implications I talked about earlier. This becomes not just a health system event. We need all government departments and we're working now to engage across government in this. And then through our colleagues in the Emergency Measures Office, starting to engage in uh, other non-healthcare sectors. So we have started to engage in conversations, for instance, with our, our critical infrastructure partners. Uh, I'll use Nova Scotia Power as an example of that. How do they maintain their core business through a business continuity plan? Exactly the conversations we worked with them 11 years ago around H1N1. We're working in government around the business continuity of continuing government programs and services, and then also reaching out, starting conversations with our municipal emergency management folks and how, what role do they play at, at the municipal level. So this is becoming a bigger event as we stand up a response now shifting to an all of government cross-sectoral approach as we do this work. So what, the Nova, what can Nova Scotians do about this right now? It sounds simple, but we are um, continue to emphasize good frequent hand washing, cough etiquette. So if you're coughing, you're sneezing into your sleeve, or if you have to cough into your hands, do it with a, a Kleenex and then throw that Kleenex away and, and wash your hands. Uh, really, we can train ourselves avoiding touching our faces, especially if we have unwashed hands. Starting to do social, social distancing. So especially if you're close face-to-face -face contact with somebody who seems sick and is coughing, making sure you're not within that two meter distance. Um, it's really important that people who are sick, if you have fever and cough, that we need to find ways, although those people the, need to be away from the rest of us, be at home for as long as they're sick. That's really important. And I recognize that for, for many Nova Scotians, there are challenges to doing that. And so we need to find ways to support them as best we can. If people do need to be out in public and they're sick, that's the time when they can use them, where we're wearing a mask actually is important. Because if you're coughing, the mask helps the virus from spreading. We're seeing a lot of people who, without symptoms who are using masks, and this is happening across the world. Asymptomatic people wearing masks, first of all, there's no evidence that that, that actually uh, has any kind of substantive impact on decreasing the transmission of a virus like this. There's also evidence that if you wear a mask, you're more likely to touch your face. So there's some evidence that actually people wearing a mask are more likely to get infected. So it's not protective. But the third piece is, is that we have a growing global supply issue around masks and gloves, personal protective equipment. So it's really important that this has to happen across the world, but we can only control things, some things in Nova Scotia. It's really important that Nova Scotians, and, and including in our healthcare system, that we use masks only when they're necessary, and that we use the right type of mask which is for this type, and there's specific masks based on good evidence for this type of virus. Because inappropriate or unnecessary use of masks could actually ex exacerbating the this, this shortage, and we may end up not having the right type of mask or enough of the right type of mask when we really need it when we actually get this illness here. So appropriate use of masks is, is a really important message for the public. The last thing I think the public can do is we, we need to start, so lots of people are going to be homesick. How do we do a better job of looking after each other within families, within communities? Especially those who are most vulnerable. So you, it's, it's the seniors, seniors with chronic conditions who are most vulnerable for se severe disease. So if we start to get community spread of COVID-19, my challenge to vote, who do we know in our communities that is vulnerable that we can actually support? Even before they get sick, maybe I have a neighbor who actually, uh, who the best thing I could do is to make sure she has groceries so she doesn't have to go out to shop, shop for groceries herself. She can actually stay home when we have community, community transmission so she's least, least likely to get infected. So it's a call for, for us as Nova Scotians to come together to really uh, say that this is much bigger than just the health system. We're doing our work in the health system, but all of us have a role to play in this starting at community level. How do we support each other to, to be well? And if we are sick, how do we support each other to, uh, if, if you don't need to be in the hospital, how do you help get the support you need when you're home until you recover? 
with that, we're going to open up for questions and more detailed questions from my colleagues in the health system. Thank you. I understand you said there have been no cases and uh, you want people to be aware. Um, well, what is the likelihood that we will likely see some kind of an outbreak in the population in Nova Scotia? So I, I can't put a number on that, but I think as the days go on, I think we're seeing now it's, it's quite probable that we are going to see some kind of community spread within Nova Scotia. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite probable that we're going to get a case. How much that case turns into a spread is somewhat dependent on what we do as soon as, so it depends on how quickly do we know about that case. So that's why we have to have the systems in place to, to get people uh, to come in for testing. And then what measures we put around them in terms of whether it's keeping people isolated at home, quarantining their contacts, all those kind of pieces. But also the things I talked about is our, collectively our hand washing and all those kind of things I talked about, that's important, going to be important to control the spread as well. So we're likely to get it here. How much it spreads is some, it depends on the virus itself, but also is somewhat dependent on, on how quickly we're able to intervene and how well we collectively adhere, adhere to what I call the public health measure, measures that'll be necessary. Dr. Chen, you mentioned the importance of uh, getting accurate information to people and We've seen in the past week all kinds of unsubstantiated rumors being shared online. If and when there is a confirmed case in the province, what is the protocol for notifying the public and how long after a case is confirmed would you notify the public? So we have a system in place. So our, right now, the, 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 the specimens we take are tested initially in our lab, and, and Jason, free for you to jump in here. They are then sent to the national lab in Winnipeg, uh, if that tested positive, the lab is going to phone Jason or his colleague, Dr. Tatchett, who can't, be, who can't be here today. The first call that they're going to make is to me. The first call that I'm going to make is to within my, my colleagues in the department. And we already have a plan in place about what the event, the press event would look like, how we would rapidly roll out the communication to Nova Scotians when we have... Uh, a confirmation of a case. But suffice it to say, unless the public hears it from you, there aren't confirmed cases. If there's a confirmed case, the word is coming from you. It's not coming from anybody else. Absolutely. Um, Thank you for uh, asking that question. You, you talked about supply availability, and I don't know, Ms. McCormick, if this is a question for you or not, but could one of you speak about the current level of supply availability as it relates to frontline healthcare workers. Do we have enough equipment, masks, gowns, all of that jazz for nurses and docs and other people who are working in hospitals and seeing patients? Uh, thank you for the question. So within our planning process so far, we've done a very close look at what supplies we currently have, what we think we will need based on the best evidence around the PPE requirements. And we looked at both our operational needs day to day, what we use on a regular basis and what we would need in reserve uh, to be ready to be able to scale up our response. Right now, um, we have no critical shortages around the supplies. We actively monitor that on a daily basis on all of the products. Um, and we continue to plan and, and work on making sure that there are no supply interruptions. Although we know there are challenges um, nationally and, and internationally around supply, we feel comfortable right now with the supply that we have based on what we think we'll face with the numbers. And we've been working with all of our partners in the health system to be ready to that uh, effect as well. What about testing? Do we have something, we hear a lot, at least in the American media, about test kits. Is that, do we have anything similar to that here and do we have enough of them if we do have them? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, every uh, uh, person under investigation gets tested with a, a, a method that is in Halifax, uh, but uh, to ensure that the, the results that are coming out of there are accurate, we've been sending them to the National Microbiology Lab in parallel. So regardless of the result that we have in, in Halifax right now, both positive and negative results, uh, we would be shipping to the National Microbiology Lab, but that's just to make sure that we're comfortable with our method. And once that method is validated, we'll be able to, to release negative results, but for the positive results, we would still uh, send them to the National Microbiology Lab for confirmation. Uh, how long? 
Have you had any positive results in the Halifax test? No, we have not. And can you speak towards just the stages that it goes through? Someone comes in and they think that they might be uh, sick with this. What? What's the timeline? What does it look like? What do, what do people expect if they are coming to the hospital? So it's normally a fairly short timeline from the collection to the transport to the lab. From the lab, uh, we uh, even before the, the sample is collected, we get notified uh, from public health uh, uh, of uh, a suspect case. So uh, once that the specimen comes into our lab, uh, we collate all the information that we've received. Uh, we run uh, daily assays to, for our in-house method. But during that stage of time, we're all, there's also uh, 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 somebody packaging up and sending to the National Microbiology Lab. So once it, ar ar it arrives to the National Microbiology Lab, so within 24 hours, we normally have the result. Dr. Dr. Strang, you said last week the threat level was low. Is it safe to say it's been bumped up now in the province, or are we still at a low level of concern, would you say? So I think we're, as we see things evolve, in even North America and now on the West Coast, I think we have to acknowledge that the likelihood of us getting uh, a case here in Nova Scotia and, and the likelihood of community uh, transmission becomes greater. I'm not going to attempt to put a number on it, but it's just we need to. And that's exactly what we've done in the last week. Uh, the initial planning was mostly focused around travelers and, and mostly focused around public health measures with some of our healthcare colleagues around the testing pieces. Now we're rapidly going to a all of health system and cr across government, cross sectoral response based on our, our plan, our pandemic planning, uh, pa pandemic plans that we already have in place. You talked about how, um, you know, as we get to the point where we might have confirmed cases, there's going to be a need for people to self-isolate. Um, there's going to be a need for people to, to be at home with them, potentially, and, and helping them, all of which takes them out of their general day-to-day -day activities. And so I wonder what your message would be to employers who require things like sick notes who, uh, and have other uh, attendance policies in place that they would normally observe. What would your message be to them as it relates to these type of circumstances? So I'm going to ask, answer your question directly in a minute, but I just I, and I, it's something that I, that I should have given more detail was up at the podium. Communication is a big piece in this. So there's a team of my colleagues in the department, public health colleagues, who are with with this communication support. We're rapidly developing information seats for a whole range of community groups. I think in your package that there was the the first of those two sheets, one for community, one for businesses. Am I correct on that? It was part of the package, comms. So that's we're going to be doing a lot more of that. But within that, you can see the messages for, for businesses, uh, really asking businesses to be part of the solution here. First of all, we do not need sick notes. We can't be clogging up our, up our health system at asking people to just uh, uh, get a note that's saying you you're, you're can come back to work. We also have some employers who, in some cases, people have been, employers have been sending people in to get tested because they've traveled somewhere outside of Canada and they would need to show that they're free of this virus before they come back to work. We've already communicated that that is not appropriate. We will not be doing those testing. We also appeal to employers to be as flexible as they can be. How do you support your employees if they can't come to work because they're sick or their family's sick? We all need to work together to try to be involved in, 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 in uh, the, our response to this, creating conditions that we can all be involved in minimizing the chance of this spreading. As you know, at the end of this month, we are to host a major international event. Of the Women World's Hockey Championships. Have you been in touch with Hockey Canada or the IHF about uh, protocols, that kind of thing? And will, will anything special be done for this event, given that it's a, many, many people covered from many areas There's, of the world? Yeah, there certainly have been uh, has been discussion between the Nova Scotia government and Hockey Canada, and I've contributed my, uh, the, the, uh, into those conversations. Uh, that decision rests with uh, with Hockey Canada, I, uh, IIHF. You'd have to you know talk with them as they consider. Uh, the conversation they've had with us in Nova Scotia. Uh, I, just, I just wonder, since you're having people coming here, is there anything you're doing to prepare for that event in particular, or is it going to just roll into what's being done in generally? I, I, from that specific event, I think it's fair to say we're still we provided a perspective to the hockey folks, and 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 they're they're taking that as part of their uh, I guess thinking and decision making as as they move forward. We'll take Kamal, one more question Dr. before we go to the phones. Dr. Kamal, how does this illness affect the kids? And are, are they? <laughs> uh, Dr. Strang had mentioned that the elderly are perhaps most susceptible to it, but where do kids fall in the susceptibility scale with this? 
to date, there's um, literature that's come mainly out of China because they've had the most experience with the virus thus far that suggests that children actually aren't hit um, particularly hard at all. Um, the percent children affected is much, much, much lower, and also the severity um, for children who are affected is lower. So there, in the most recent literature, there were um, 72,000 cases that uh, were looked at in a case series. And of children under nine, there were no deaths. Um, there haven't been any children um, in that age range that needed um, intensive care admission either. So we're working in partnership with NSHA and public health to ensure that the IWK is prepared both for children and for our, our women, um, but knowing that the severity in children doesn't seem to be what it is in the elderly. We'll go to the phone lines now. For those of you on the phone, please identify who your question is for. We will take three questions from the phones. Uh, Dr. Strang, it's uh, Jennifer Henderson, uh, freelance journalist for the Halifax Examiner. You mentioned that you had offered a perspective to Hockey Canada and the IIHF with respect to the upcoming World Championships. Is it your recommendation at this time that the event should not proceed? So I think it's I think that that perspective is a, is a dialogue between uh, the Nova Scotia government and and the, and the hockey officials and and we're looking forward to uh, hearing from them in time. Could I ask a follow up with respect to that? There there will be something like three hundred and fifty to four hundred athletes, managers, coaches arriving from ten countries. Will will those individuals be tested or screened for COVID-19 when they arrive in Nova Scotia? So we, we, we have not made specific plans around the tournament because things can change very rapidly over the, that that tournament is, is at least a few weeks away. We have provided, provided, as I said, a perspective around from a Nova Scotia perspective. It's not just a health perspective. There's multiple perspectives. That dialogue has happened with the hockey officials and and we'll we'll work with them as they make a decision. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll go to someone else. Does anyone else on the phone have a question for one of our panelists? Yes, uh, Olivier Lefebvre from Radio-Canada, CBC. My question is for Dr. Strang. Um, as a citizen, if I feel some uh, symptoms, flu-like symptoms or other symptoms, uh, when is the right time to go to the doctor or call 811? When, when should I do that? So, uh, in general, I'm going to try to break that out a little bit. And first of all, for, for, for if you're concerned about you might have COVID-19, it's, it's not just symptoms, it's a combination of have you, have you traveled somewhere uh, where there is spread, community spread of, of COVID-19 in the last 14 days, and now do you have some respiratory symptoms. In those circumstances, if you're concerned in those, we're asking you to call 811 because they can take you through a more detailed screening process. And then if if you screen in and you need testing, they can direct you and how you could go and go get tested. In general, if you have influenza-like symptoms, fever, cough, et cetera, um, most of those people can be managed at home. Uh, I can't get into kind of the, the medical advice, you know, if, if you're severely unwell or if you have concerns, I think that if you have concerns, I think the best advice is to call 811 and they can then take you through a protocol and give you much better individual advice. At any time, if people are feeling uh, severely unwell and they feel that there is some kind of an urgent or emergent event, then calling 911 is the best option. Do you Tina, uh, can, can, can I ask what are the implications for long-term care homes in the province? So certainly continuing care is, is, is at the table as part of our planning. Uh, I think what we're working on is, that, is two things. How do we, as the best we can, make sure that we're keeping uh, COVID-19 out of our long-term care facilities? And so as we, as we work in all our public health measures and, and uh, those things, that, that's an objective, uh, knowing uh, that you know, there are many vulnerable people in those, in those communities. We've also been working with our long-term care facilities already, making sure they, they, they're following the right infection control uh, measures, right use of gowns and gloves, et cetera, 
there are standard infection control measures for a respiratory virus that should be in place all the time. It's no different than whether it's flu or COVID-19, but we're just supporting those continuing care on the, to make sure they have uh, following all those infection control measures. And then moving forward to working with them to what can we do to minimize the, the introduction uh, into a long-term care facility. A lot of that goes back to early testing and identification and then either quarantining contacts or isolating cases. And if it was a healthcare worker who was in a long-term care facility, we would absolutely, part of that self-isolation of somebody who's sick would be not going and working in the long-term care facility until we were sure that they were no longer infectious. We'll go back to the phone lines for one more questions from the phone. Uh, Evan from CKBW for Dr. Strang. Are there any seasonal associations with this? Are we expecting the disease to be exacerbated by warmer spring weather or is it made worse by winter? Is there any correlation at all? I think it's too early to tell. We know in general respiratory viruses do have a winter seasonality, but we learned from H1N1 and that popped up in, uh, in late April. Uh, so it's, it's just too early to tell with this novel coronavirus. Do you have a follow-up question, Evan? No. Thank you. We'll come back to the room for a few more. Dr. Strang, you mentioned uh, you're at the point now where you're looping in other, other parties beyond just the health department. Can you talk about what conversations, if any, are happening <coughs> with the port as it relates to the pending cruise ship season? So I've had an initial conversation, thanks for the question, with our colleagues at uh, the regional office of the Public Health Agency of Canada. There are multiple federal jurisdictions who are involved when you when you talk about cruise ships or even commercial ships. There's Transport Canada, uh, Public Safety Canada, Canadian Border Service Ag Agencies, Public Health Agency of Canada has the quarantine officers. What the federal government is doing, uh, and certainly I'm involved in lots of federal, provincial, territorial conversations, and 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 the public health agency Canada is, is leading this discussions. All those federal jurisdictions starting to come together uh, uh, to develop response plans for cruise ships. At a, at a high level, we need it's it's the west coast. There's even cruise ships up in the north, and there's and on the east coast. Uh, they need to take the lead on that, and they have clearly stepped in and be starting to taking the lead. At, uh, and very soon, we'll become connected into what are the specific issues we need to plan for here in Halifax. But it's a, it's a, it's a national, federal-led conversation around cruise ships that is evolving. Dr. Strang, your website has been updated that deals with coronavirus, I saw, and it has a lot more information now, saying that people should also be prepared for 72 hours isolation. Um, we're also seeing a lot of people going out buying three years supply worth of toilet paper. Is there need for this kind of, not mass hysteria, but do people really need to be doing this kind of stuff? Well, the, the 72 hours, that's a standard emergency man, uh, um, kind of preparedness measure that we should all be prepared all the time for to be able to, for, for three days to kind of be on our own in our homes with our families. I would ask people that there's, you know, we don't need to go out and panic and be this mass stockpiling of toilet paper, et cetera. Uh, we do need to be prepared that take some reasonable steps that you may be at home for a bit of time. So things like we're asking people, make sure that you have a good supply of your prescription medications. And if you're running low in the next few weeks, it's a good time to get a, a renewal because if you wait a couple more weeks, it may be that our health system has a lot more pressures on it. And, and so the simple steps like that, uh, making sure you have, you know, a lot of people saying, you know, a, a little bit of extra food stockpiled and those kind of things. But I guess reasonable approaches without mass hoarding and stuff, because um, that just feeds into the fear and anxiety. We have about 10 minutes left. Go ahead, Ben. Dr. Strang, you've talked about limiting mass gatherings in the event of an outbreak. It's fair to say that a hockey game would count, but have you guys actually defined what a mass gathering is? Would it include a restaurant or a church even? So we're, we're involved in, uh, I have twice weekly calls with my chief MOH colleagues across the country, and we're actually working through the details of this because it's really important that uh, you know, there is a, not a standard definition of a mass gathering, but, you know, when lots of people come together. So, but we need to be more refined on that definition and also making sure that the thinking that we would go through and the, the things that we need to consider to make a decision as a public health official whether we do or do not close down math ga mass gatherings and what type we might close down, we need to make sure that we're doing that and from on a consistent basis. So it may be that next week, and I'm just speaking theoretically here, that they need to make that decision in British Columbia. 
It may not be for another two months before I need to make that decision in Nova Scotia, but we need to make consistency is really important that we're making the decisions in the same way with the, weighing up the same factors. Uh, and, and we're always, all these decisions are always going to be based on how effect, what's going to be the impact of an intervention to limit the spread of disease, knowing that every time we make a decision like this, there are impacts in society. So closing down mass gatherings has lots of impacts. So we're always going to be trying to find the best balance of what's necessary for the disease, uh, and especially with a focus on how do we protect those most vulnerable seniors, but also knowing that there are going to be impacts that, uh, that, that, are, that, uh, that ripple out as well, and, and how, do we, how do we weigh those up as well. So doing that in a consistent, thoughtful way across the country as we make these decisions is important. So that's a lot of our discussions we have on all of my teleconferences with my colleagues across the country. A lot of other provinces are reporting presumptive cases. Um, why are we not doing so, so oh yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So it, it's actually a lab issue. Uh, so it, it's the same concept that I was talking about. That we have a, a method that we're validating in Nova Scotia, but until that we're comfortable with this method, we're not. We 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 can't release the results per se. Positive or negative would go to the, the National Microbiology Lab uh, until the assay is validated. Uh, but uh, once we have that assay validated, we would be releasing the negative results, and it, a presumptive, uh, we would release a presumptive positive, but send it off to the National Microbiology Lab for confirmation. Is there any risk right now that uh, the National Biology Lab in Winnipeg will get overwhelmed um, trying to confirm cases as cases grow across Canada? Like, could that 48-hour window take longer? Uh, I mean, uh, it, it's a tough question to ask because, I mean, uh, they're, they're constantly reassessing their needs, but one of the, the strategies that they've taken is uh, they've been working with the provinces to, to disseminate protocols and so that the, the provincial public health labs can deal uh, with uh, the testing on their own and develop plans on their own. So there is planning that occurs. Um, Dr. Strang, regarding you were talking about yeah, hospitals needing to be ready about it. Um, so while a lot of hospitals are, are overflown right now, what is being done for them to be ready to have the one person in five? So I can uh, share a little bit of the Nova Scotia Health Authority perspective. So we recognize that an event such as COVID-19 will be uh, an important uh, piece of our planning around patient flow and capacity in our hospitals. and so. We are actively planning with many partners around that and it is a big priority for us. Um, we're strengthening our ability to respond by thinking about um, areas or services within our uh, system that we may need to slow down, pause or stop if we needed to redirect our efforts to managing uh, patients with COVID-19 as an example. We also continue to focus on um, opportunities to really maximize other care environments for patients outside of the hospital um, if they could receive care in another way and we do that with all of our partners and so it's a it's an area of planning that we have ongoing efforts around and we know that while it will be a challenge it's one that we we are working to uh, find active solutions to that have you been looking for additional space in the in the event that your hospitals get swamped and you have to put place people elsewhere so I think the, the first route is really around continuity planning. So we would look within our own uh, environment first to see what services or service areas we may be able to redirect into a different uh, purpose. So how could we repurpose, uh, for example, a clinic to provide ongoing uh, inpatient care in an environment if we were faced with that. We've also looked at our critical care capacity as an example to see if we needed to create more capacity for critical care patients, how we would do that. We had that same plan uh, active during H1N1 should we have needed to activate that. So we've taken all of those factors into account and begun to uh, plan around that. And, and we have uh, at times been faced with that before. You know, if we have an area of our building that uh, becomes unusable due to construction or, or another incident, um, you know, uh, we have to close down a, a section for renovation, what have you. We always take into account how we could offer the service in another way. Uh, within our facilities or what we might need to slow down or change what we do to make capacity for more critical service. Uh, coming back to the uh, hockey tournament and mass uh, gathering, so you're saying right now for the tournament it's Hockey Canada's responsibility to decide what's going to happen, but at what point will it switch and it will be your decision 
that uh, these types of gatherings should be uh, canceled or at least controlled? So, I mean, that's a specific one. It's Hockey Canada and IHS working together. So um, there are things, authorities I could use under the Pub under the Health Protection Act. That, but uh, we'd, we'd like to, if we get to that point, I think we'd be like looking to work as collaboratively as we could with if there's a specific event with the organizers or if it's in general, say we need to do something uh, uh, around uh, around schools or whatever, we're going to work collaboratively with whoever sector, with, which, with that sector there is, to try to come up with, with uh, solutions and, and that we can all uh, be supportive of. Uh, but ultimately, I do have authorities uh, w with the direction from the Minister of Health un as, uh, under the Health Protection Act that we can actually order, order pieces, but that's kind of like a last resort. We'd like to work collaboratively uh, and, and with, in a cooperative manner as much as we can. We'll take two more questions. So, so just to tie it up with a bow, you're, you're cooperating with these international bodies, but if, if they take a decision that you don't agree with, you ultimately have the power to say, no, you can't come here. Is that what you're telling us? So I, I don't want to get into the details of the hockey piece. I mean, that would be an ongoing conversation. We've provided a perspective. They'll make a decision, and then we'll, you know, we'll have to see where we go from there in, in terms of the province of Nova Scotia in conversation with them. We have time for one more question. Can we get confirmation on the number of cases that have been tested? Because I think you said 23, but earlier this week I was being told 26. So the lab numbers are updated weekly. Uh, they're posted on the Flu Watch website, uh, it, and it, so there's always the the one week lag. So there's it, it was 20 cases that was last posted. It's 23 to date. So that have been tested? confirmed negative. Yeah. Okay, but more could have been tested. We just have 23 confirmation. Exactly. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.